Welcome everyone. This is the monthly colloquium for our Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics. I'm Van McCrary, a member of the faculty, and here to introduce our very special guest today, Dr. James H. Jones. Dr. Jones is alumni, distinguished professor emeritus at the University of Arkansas. He has a PhD from Indiana University in American Social and Intellectual History. He is held numerous fellowships, including NIMH, Harvard University, Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the National Endowment for Humanities. He's written two major books. The first is Bad Blood, the story of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. He gave us a rousing lecture at noon on that today, which was well attended. And uh, his second major book is Alfred C. Kinsey, A Private Public Life. Bad Blood won numerous awards and was named one of the best 12 books of the year by the New York Times Book Review. His um, work on Kinsey was one of the two finalists for the 1997 Pulitzer Prize. His publications run the gamut from Hastings Center Report, a well-known specialty bioethics journal, and the New Yorker magazine. Uh, that's enough introduction, so uh, please help me welcome Dr. Jones. Thank you very much, Van. Uh, again, I'm very happy to be in Stony Brook. And uh, I want to say thanks to my host, Van, and to Dr. Post, Stephen. I appreciate being here. Um, it's an opportunity in this talk to uh, discuss with you uh, a work in progress. Okay, this book is, uh, uh, you're seeing the laundry before it's washed, all right? <laughs> uh, it's under contract uh, to Harvard University Press. Uh, I'm having fun with my editor uh, as she shares her ideas and I uh, uh, try to respond. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a story that I have been wanting to tell for a lot of years. And I think I'll start with how I got interested in the story. Um, how many of you know about the bubble boy? Is that a familiar, is familiar to you? Okay, all right. Uh, often when I speak with medical students, I'll say the bubble boy and I'll get, duh, you know, because you know, it's, not, uh, it's not part of their generation. Uh, this is a child who lived in the 70s and 80s, so mm -hmm. we're talking about someone who's been dead a quarter of a century. Uh, but he was a child who, to my family, was, was very dear and very close. Uh, I spent most of my career before I went to the University of Arkansas, uh, I spent most of my career at the University of Houston. And my family lived uh, just south of Rice University on Swift Street, which placed it about you know, four blocks from the Texas Medical Center. By a coincidence, my son is named David, uh, and by another coincidence, uh, David Vetter, the child about whom I'll be speaking, uh, and my daughter, Laura, the oldest, are within, I think, two weeks of each other in age. And Laura, in particular, uh, became interested in David when she was a child because they grew up, you know, kind of on parallel tracks, she with freedom, he inside an isolator. And she followed his, uh, his case and his travail with just uh, raptured, I mean, heartfelt interest. She loved that child uh, like a brother. And I think many people in Houston kind of had that feeling toward David. He was, uh, he was part of our community. Uh, part of it had to do with the, the fact that the medical reporters for the, uh, for the two local papers, papers, the Chronicle and the Post, uh, both uh, would give periodic reports on David, especially uh, his birthdays and around Christmas time, there would be these kind of warm and fuzzy, you know, articles about, uh, about the bubble boy. So uh, everyone watched that story uh, and we all wanted it to turn out well. Uh, there, was, there was this hope. By the way, I think the title of my book uh, is not going to be The Technology of Hope. It's going to be The Agony of Hope. Okay, uh, and I'll explain. 
So I became, or I decided to write a book on David when I was winding down from writing my Kinsey biography. Uh, the only way I can uh, stay out of trouble uh, is to have a project going. <laughs> and uh, one of my professors in graduate school said uh, that ending a book was like you know, ending an affair. Uh, I don't know whether I was that emotional about it, but I do know that there is a postpartum when you, when you, when you finish a major, a major work. There's a big hole in your life. And uh, those of you who publish and, and try to put words on, on paper uh, know that uh, there's a part of you that craves the intellectual challenge of looking at a blank screen, looking at all those notes, and trying to make sense out of it, you know, trying to create a narrative and, and find the story that's hidden in all those documents. So, uh, when David died in 1984, my David was five, and he had just started Little League. And when the opening day ceremony for Little League happened that, that spring, the announcer asked people in the audience to just observe a moment of silence for David Vetter. So, here are all these adorable munchkins, you know, and they're in their little league <coughs> uniforms, their cute little butts, you know, in those, in those uniforms. And you look around at the people, uh, and I'm irreverent enough to raise my head and look at people <laughs> in this kind of situation. I'm a born observer. Uh, and I saw so much emotion. You know, so much emotion and, and sadness in those people's faces. And so I thought that any child who could touch that many people in death probably had a story that was worth examining. And I also thought that the story would be pretty much at odds with the uh, public David, the, the canon that we, that we had for David. That that canon, as presented, was uh, remarkably similar with every report. It was the plucky, happy, well-adjusted child in the isolator who, with great courage and great perseverance, was waiting for science to rescue him. Well, if any of us, I think, had thought two seconds about that narrative, and the extreme handicapped nature of his incarceration, or handicapping nature of his incarceration, I think we would have known that it was just too counterintuitive, that it, was, that it would be a miracle if a child living under those circumstances uh, could be happy, well-adjusted, and free of conflict. Uh, so uh, my first book with Bad Blood I tried to use the Tuskegee syphilis experiment to really look at kind of larger questions about race and medicine. And I thought that the uh, advantage of that topic was that I could create something with a strong narrative pulse that would get people interested in the story, and then I could sneak a whole lot of history by them. You know, that was, you know, that was the goal. And with David, as I write this book, I find myself you know, wanting to use this child in his life to talk about uh, children and human experimentation. Because that, in every sense of the word, is what David's life was. It was a slow motion experiment to see whether a child you know, could, could be saved and flourish under, that, under those circumstances. Uh, I'll, instead of Integrating uh, photographs with my talk, I think I'll just give you a quick walkthrough so you can look at the munchkin we're talking about. You know, we can we can see David because I want you to have a visual image. And then I'll then I'll say some things. So there's David, qua infant, uh, in his isolator, and you can see his toy above him. Uh, cute kid. This will be a central person about whom I'll be speaking. This is uh, John R. Montgomery, okay, Jack. 
uh, and he was the pediatric immunologist who was responsible for David's case. He, he, was, his, he was his clinician. He was David's doctor. Uh, that's David. Is, he looks like he's about maybe four there, three or four. This is the second member of the Troika of uh, physicians who are uh, deeply involved with David's case and the decision to put him in the isolator. This is Mary Ann South. She too is a pediatric immunologist. Uh, she was at Baylor at the time. Uh, she later went to Penn and was at, at CHOP uh, for, for a period. And then she went to, uh, uh, Texas Tech out in El Paso and I think was head of pediatrics there, if, if memory serves. Uh, this is Raphael Wilson, <coughs> uh, who is the third member of the group, and in many ways he is a crucial player, if not the most critical, uh, because he's the master of the technology that I'll be discussing. He's the person whose idea is to put David in isolation. This is the mother, Carol Ann, the sister. And I love this photograph for what it shows in the background. That's David's life. That's him with his nose and face pushed against what he can't be part of. He cannot touch that sister. He cannot touch that mother. He is scrunched up against the membrane. Uh, they could bump heads. That was part of their way to try to, you know, experience closeness. Uh, she would try to actually generate, you know, the warmth of her body through the membrane to uh, let her feel, or, or let David feel. Uh, there's, there's David, uh, just kind of mugging for the camera. Uh, That Prince Valiant haircut, I kind of like it. <laughs> yeah. Again, there he is. Um, yeah, who's that? Oh, okay. yeah, that's Raphael Wilson again. You see David's uh, posture, uh, this. Uh, they would have what, what they called man talks, man to man talks. And his, uh, his typical, uh, you know, he'd love to look down at adults. <laughs> So this is, this is David getting to have uh, a little leverage, a little advantage, and uh, you know, look, look down as the person to put him in. Okay, this woman, Dr. Mary Murphy, I'll say quite a few things about in a few moments. Um, she was a child who, I mean, she was a person, a child psychologist, who came into David's life when David was three. She was brought in basically to test him to see how he was doing developmentally. And uh, she was divorced, had a son who was almost grown, was very vulnerable to the needs of a very needy child, and she became a surrogate mother and was easily one of the best things that ever happened to David. Uh, there they are. Uh, the full team, or not the full team, because Wilson is missing, but that's that's a birth pick. No, no, Wilson's there. Yeah, I see him. That's the full team. Okay, just another view of the isolator. As David gets older, they try to create more space for him. You know, the apartments for each unit get bigger. He has a sleeping unit. He has a play unit uh, where they can things can go in and come out, and all has to be sterilized. Uh, that's a green plastic frog, okay, that they bought him to put his toys in, okay, because he was a slob. He didn't, you know, he never put anything up. But when they put that in, guess, guess what the first thing David did with? Any, any, did with it. Any, any guesses? Climb inside it? Excuse me? Did he climb inside it? Absolutely. <laughs> he got inside it and he shut the top <laughs> because it was the first time in his life he'd have any privacy, the very first time he could have any control of, of his environment. Uh, 
Okay. Again, there he is. He's growing up now in front of our eyes. That's homeschooling. That's one of his teachers who comes. David had a had a pretty high IQ and was uh, you know was was sharp. This is uh, the much touted uh, spacesuit they called it. It's a portable. It's a portable mini version of his of his uh, isolated unit. But for the first time, he gets out of that bubble. He's able. He's tethered to you know a, um, a support uh, <clears throat> motor for air and whatnot. But he's able to move around. And um, you know, children learn so much by doing. And the circumstances of his existence made doing almost anything impossible. So uh, when they take him out, uh, th there's a whole literature, there are articles on David's um, developmental uh, issues. And one of them has to do with his, his, his vision and what he sees and what he can't see. He lived in a one-dimensional world, world. He didn't know what happened when people went around corners. You know, that's just not part of, you know, so his perceptions of the world are very interesting. And one of the first things that he wanted to do when he got out, he's carrying his little life support system with him or dragging it in the wagon, is that he wanted to go around the corner. What in the world is around the corner? And then there are photographs of him just being mesmerized, standing in front of a faucet, watching water drip. I mean, it's just, okay, just very, very simple things. There, there, he's watching the water drip. Uh, and he's six years old. David the reader. Unfortunately, David never developed into being an avid reader. Mary pushed him as hard as she could to get him to read. But he, he, was, he was not, not an avid reader. Uh, can help with a word. Uh, what the public really didn't know is that David spent most of his life in the hospital, to be sure, but they set up an isolating system at home. And it was in the, uh, the living room. It took over the living room of the veteran's home, and they, could, they had another unit they could put him in out here and drag him out. So um, on, on the periods when he went home, he could be outside some as long as he was in that. Uh, there's sis mom birthday celebration. Okay, that's one of my favorite photographs today. But he's just mugging for the camera, you know, just being a kid. Okay, seventy nine. This is the doctor who will eventually get David out of the isolator. This is William Shearer. Uh, he's a pediatric immunologist as well. Uh, and he'll perform the, the priestly duty of persuading the parents to take the risk. Uh, this is when David is uh, being prepared for his bone marrow transplant that basically will end his life. There's Mary. You can see her concerned face. You know, behind the nurse, you see the woman. That, that's Mary Murphy, and she is... Uh, deeply, deeply worried about whether this is going to work. Okay, so these are just last photographs of the bone marrow transplant scene. Okay, that's that's David's tombstone. It gives you his life, September 21, 71, February 22nd, 84. Now watch this. He never touched the world but the world was touched by him. That's his epitaph. Now, one more. What do you see here? Two, two gravestones, side by side. And on one side is his older brother, who is named David. And on the other side is the David we know. They are separated. The, the older David was 11 months older. So let's start there. The first David, David I, uh, David Philip, is born 11 months before David II. 
And for the first three months of his life, he is a darling, happy, well-adjusted, typical baby. Then, inexplicably, he starts having infections. And uh, the infections are treated symptomatically, but a diagnosis is not made. He's just called sickly. And that's at month three. By month four, uh, the infections are getting worse. And the local pediatrician, Dr. Reagan, who is treating him in the suburbs of Alpacati Freeway, uh, punts. He says, you know, I, I don't know what's going on with this kid, but I'm not doing him a hell of a lot of good. So why don't you take him to Children's Hospital? You know, take him to Houston and see, see what they can find out. So they take him to the, to, you know, the Texas Medical Center. And uh, Nancy Bird, who is one of their star pediatricians, and I know she's great because she was my children's pediatrician, <laughs> and, so, and we're very fond of Nancy. Uh, Nancy uh, starts to make some associations. She starts to suspect that uh, there may be some immune system issues here. So she calls in uh, John Montgomery, Jack Montgomery, the, the stocky guy in, in the photographs. He is a pioneer in the field. I mean, the field of immunology is, is an infancy. You know, it dates from the early 50s. And pediatric immunology is even more uh, inchoate than, than uh, you know, the adult counterpart. So they don't really get it at first. They continue to treat him symptomatically for some stuff. And then Jack Montgomery calls in Mary Ann South, and then it clicks. They said, we think this is skid. We think this is severe combined immune deficiency. And we think we've got a child in deep trouble. When I say a child in deep trouble, I want to tell you the, what, what Jack Montgomery told me. Uh, Jack was a, he's the grandson of a physician. He was a star football player in high school and in college. Uh, he's the type of guy who uh, goes to Mexico and goes to bullfights and drinks, you know, wine out of goat skins. I mean, he's a macho guy. And he's one of the most competitive people I think I've ever met in my life. I mean, he, Jack would cut your heart out to win. Uh, and the thing that makes him competitive also makes him driven. Uh, when I talked with him about David, when I interviewed him, he said that one of the things about being at a large medical center like Texas that serves a huge hinterland and consolidates cases from a vast area is that you see rare diseases. Uh, he said David, David Vetter, this David, was the eighth skid patient he had seen in three years. And those first seven patients he buried. And with each funeral, he went to the funeral, I mean, with each death, he went to the funerals personally with the families, attending, you know, their emotional needs as best he could, and absolutely seething inside. Because as he told me, he said, I didn't become a doctor to bury kids. I became a pediatrician to save them. And this was a disease that had kicked my ass seven times, and I was sick of it. He said, I was sick of it. He said, I can't tell you how much I hated skin. So when this David becomes ill, history repeats itself. He literally can't do anything. The child continues to get infections. He died of pneumonia a particular type of pneumonia, which is the common death in skid. And he, you know, it was it was same song, eighth verse. Nothing had changed. Well, when the first David died, uh, the parents were understandably uh, grief-stricken. Uh, you go home, there's a nursery, there's no child in that nursery. What do you do with the, with the child's, you know, clothes? How do you how do you fell a hole in their heart? Uh, you know they were emotionally uh, devastated. 
And a few weeks after the child's death, they returned to the hospital for a counseling session because Methodist and the Children's Hospital, I think it was common practice, to have, after the death of a child, meetings with the attending physicians to share the results of the autopsy, but to also testify to them that everything that could have been done was done so that they have some peace and some closure that no door was left unopened, that everything that, again, could be done was done. This is also good public relations. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it, it puts a very warm human face on doctors and, 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 and on hospitals. It's caring, it's loving, it's the right thing to do. Well, during this, uh, during this grief counseling session, it quickly morphed into something different because Mary Ann, or excuse me, Carol Ann, the mother, shared with the doctors that they were thinking about having another child. In fact, they were very seriously considering having another child. Now, why? Uh, they wanted a son. It was very important to David Sr., the father is also named David. It was very important to him that he have a male, a male heir. Uh, a football buddy, you know, a son. And he made no bones of the fact that this was something that he was committed to, was, was willing to discuss certainly, but had a very strong emotional investment in doing. So what started as, as grief counseling uh, rapidly becomes a genetic counseling session. And in this session, they share their understanding of, of SCID, uh, simple Mendelian genetics. Uh, the mother, uh, in this instance, is a carrier. Uh, any male child born to this mother will have a 50% chance of having the disease. Any female child will have a 50% chance of being a carrier. And uh, so Mr. Vetter, David Vetter Sr., listens to this, uh, or listens you know, to these odds, and says, and this is a quote, I'm a poker player. That's odds one in four, doesn't sound bad. Well, it doesn't sound bad if maybe you've got 20 cents in the game, or 20 bucks, but we're talking, you know, about something a great deal more uh, risky. Much more is at stake. But he is, he is adamant that he wants a son. Mrs. Vetter, Carol Ann, is more cautious okay, with her feelings and her intentions. She asks really the pertinent question, or one of the pertinent questions, not the, I'll have to choose my article adjectives well. Uh, she, what she asks a pertinent question, and that is, if we have, if we get pregnant, and if I am pregnant with another boy, um, God would not do this to me again. She says, I'm sure of that. They are, I, I, I neglected to mention that this family is deeply religious. They are very, very devoted Catholics. And they can almost talk about, you know, teleological determinism in their lives. You know, they see the hand of God you know, in, in, in human affairs. And they're convinced that any just God uh, would not let this happen twice. But, she says, if, God forbid, I have another child who has skid, what could you do for this child that you were not able to do for the first? Because I cannot have my heart broken twice. So this is where Raphael Wilson comes in. Raphael Wilson was a pioneer in the field of notobiology. Uh, he has an interesting background before he comes to this case, but I'm going to truncate it and just tell you about the part that's pertinent. Immediately before coming to Baylor, he had a postdoctoral fellowship and a one-year leave from Notre Dame in Ulm, Germany. 
and he was there for the opening of a brand new medical school in Ulm. He got there because he had participated um, the preceding year in an international conference in Japan in which the Japanese government had flown in a number of people to talk with them about their fear of a Chinese germ warfare attack. And so they were talking with people from, with different expertise about what they could do. At that meeting, Raphael Wilson met the dean of the medical school in Ulm and uh, said, oh, gee, I've kind of got this leave coming up for, uh, from uh, Notre Dame. Oh, gee, what am I going to do? You know? And so he invited him uh, to have a fellowship in the new medical school and helped them set up basically their rat labs because he had been working with a number of the experts at Notre Dame, which is kind of you know, the home of notobiology uh, because of people who developed that technology in the 20s and 30s there, uh, 40s and 50s for that matter. It was the Mecca. Uh, so they were interested in having him come and help. Well, when he got over there, he expected to be working exclusively on some stuff in you know, hematology and, and uh, some, again, mice and, and, and rat uh, breeding and other work. And instead, there were a pair of German twins, the Rohinger twins, who uh, had been brought to the hospital as infants uh, about six weeks old, no, no, yeah, six weeks old, and they were showing signs of infection. And what was troubling about their infections was that they had an older brother who two years earlier had died of scab. So it was the Germans, not the Americans, who developed the first isolating unit for skid children. And Raphael Wilson was kind of a, um, I don't want to be unkind, but kind of a factotum in this, in this picture. Everything's in place, the technology's there, his, his, his relationship with those children is very tangential. He plays very little role in, in their lives. But he's a smart guy. He observes the technology. He, he sees how it works. And when he goes to a conference in notobiology in Belgium that year, he talks with American doctors who are there, and he starts touting. You know, he starts touting this, this way of keeping kids alive and germ-free until you can maybe find a cure for them. So when his post, actually he doesn't finish his postdoc there. He, uh, he comes home in about eight months and he is hired um, by DeBakey, okay, at, uh, at Baylor. DeBakey is doing uh, heart plants at that point. He's kind of in competition with Cooley and there's a lot of, you know, big egos on the line. Uh, and he is supposed to help out with some germ-free uh, concerns for the surgery, for the heart transplant surgery. About a month after he joins the faculty at Baylor, DeBakey throws his hands up and says, to hell with heart plants, I can't get them to work, Cooley can have them, you know. So he turns in another direction, and at this point, Raphael Wilson is, you know, kind of down in the basement with mice and uh, not doing as sexy stuff as he had been. But he is friends he is friends with Mary Ann South, the pediatrician. And he touts to Mary Ann South this notion of an isolator where you can keep kids germ-free. And they talk about what a wonderful thing it could be if you could get a child to live long enough to teach them something. So not have a kid who, who dies the first five, six, eight months. So basically, they're looking for a baby. They're looking for a baby. And when Mrs. Vetter, Carol Ann, comes in and you know, says, what can you do for my child that you couldn't do, I mean, for my new son if I, if I have one and has the disease, Jack Montgomery and Carol Ann uh, Smith, or excuse me, Mary Ann South, share with him the experience of the German twins. And it is a mesmerizing, mesmerizing uh, uh, image in their minds. So what they decide 
is that if she does get pregnant, and if she is, they'll be able to tell through amniocentesis carrying a, a boy, then they will prepare for a germ-free delivery. They will put that child in isolation. They will do the testing then to see whether he has skid. If he doesn't have skid, no sweat. He comes out, everything's cool. If he does have skid, the thought is they will keep him germ-free and transplant him. What I didn't mention, by the way, and I should have, was that with David one, the last desperate attempt to save him is a bone marrow transplant from his sister. Okay, and it doesn't take. Uh, he, he is frankly too ill by the time uh, he gets that transplant for it to even have a real prospect of taking, but they hadn't performed one and they wanted to do it and they wanted to kind of get that experience going. So when David comes, uh, or, or when she gets pregnant, uh, literally a few weeks later, uh, they all get together and they all decide that they will, that they will uh, take the child by cesarean, they will do the best they can to have a germ-free delivery, they will put the child in isolation, and then they will uh, use the sister again, but much sooner before he becomes critically ill, to transplant him. Now, what they don't do when they're selling this to the parents is they don't really explain the odds of the chances of that, of that sister being a match donor. They present it as though it's just, you know, going to happen. And that is a critical, critical misfire, okay, in the honesty and helpfulness of that genetic counseling. Uh, the family is, un is proceeding under the supposition or under the belief, I should say, that if he has skid, if the baby has skid, then they can, they, can, they can do the transplant. So the pregnancy is routine. There are no complications. Uh, they agree upon a delivery date uh, in which the child will be taken by cesarean. The date comes, and before it comes, they bring her to the hospital. Uh, I've got a detailed description of the preparations because it's really cool stuff. Uh, you can't imagine the lengths they went to to create a, a germ-free uh, delivery. They create this wonderfully redundant filter, you know, filtration system. They scrub the walls with, you know, toxic chemicals that would have killed, you know, uh, the hardiest rat. <laughs> you know, they scrub her to an inch of her life. Uh, they triple gown uh, when, they, when they had the delivery uh, Raphael Wilson, okay, who is the guru of all this technology, uh, is in the delivery room with him. Now, what I didn't mention, and I'm saving it for dramatic appeal, guess what religion Raphael Wilson is? He's a Catholic. And guess what kind of Catholic he is? He's a Catholic brother. He's a member of the Holy Cross or the, or the, or the Notre Dame uh, sect there, yeah. So when he speaks, he speaks not only with the authority of science, he has the imprimatur of God. And he tells them this technology can work. He, by the way, becomes the godfather of David, David the bubble boy, when he's born, and he never sees any conflict in his roles, none whatsoever. So when David is born with all these heroic preparations, Raphael Wilson is in the delivery room. There is holy water that has been sterilized before them. Uh, one of the parts of the delivery is that nothing is done uh, spoken. It's all done with a series of signals, of eye signals, because they wanted to keep the air as still as they possibly could. And they rehearsed all this and rehearsed it and got everything down. So when the appropriate time comes, he looks at the mother, looks at Carol Ann, she gives him the look, he baptizes David and puts him in the isolator and they whisk him away. And this is where the story really begins. They have a child now in the United States, not in Germany, in an isolator. Within a matter of a week, they determine that he does have skid. And Within a matter of a week and a half, 
they determine that the sister is not a suitable donor. And guess what? There's no plan B. There's no plan B. The plan at this point, you know, if you go back and read what the treatments are for students, they were talking about thymuses and thymus, you know, thymal tissue transplants, and they were talking about this and that, but they all understand uh, pretty clearly that there's no treatment. So all they can do, really, is keep David in the isolator and see whether science can catch up, see whether something can, they're, you know, they understand really that a transplant, a bone marrow transplant is gonna be the only efficacious treatment. And they're scared to death of graft host. They've got to worry about so, so many things and they just kind of, kind of keep it there. So David now is in the isolator and uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'll give you a fast forward, okay, basically of his life. Uh, the first year of David's life, year and a half as I've written it, I would not wish on a child. Um, too many people have access to the body Patricia Bielmere, who was a notobiologist and became David's first surrogate mother, told me that David, by the time he was nine months old, his feet looked like a, pin, uh, a pin cushion. So many people had taken blood samples of him without a protocol, with no one controlling access to the body, that when he saw any adult go into his room, he would scream in terror because his association with people was that he got stuck. Okay, so they, you know, have something called a papoose board, you know, and they tie him to that, and that immobilizes him, and that lets them, you know, so they've got, you know, oh, I didn't, uh, uh, the second chapter of my book, by the way, is entitled, I Have My Baby. What I didn't say was that when Raphael Wilson came out of the delivery room, he grabbed one of the scrub nurses, gave her a big hug, and said, I have my baby. Okay, so science is going to go forward. All right, so David is, uh, is a child who is locked 24-7, that he doesn't go home uh, for a while yet, in this isolator. Uh, people have access to his body. Uh, too many, he's actually anemic from, from, from the blood, from the blood uh, uh, fakings. And um, at this point, there's really what I call a search for order in my mind in, in the handling of this case. You need somebody to come in and kind of take control. And fortunately, uh, by the time he's a year and a half, there's a woman uh, who is uh, a very excellent clinician and a very tough cookie who performs that role. She's a pediatrician and she's the first you know, female full professor of pediatrics at Baylor. And she creates charts. She creates uh, barriers for access to the body. Uh, Patricia Bielmere, the neurobiologist who reads to David every night and is, as I say, is a surrogate mother, she kind of is a sentry. You know, she, you know, she's there every night to try to protect him. And things at this point start to get a little better. But the problem really has a lot to do with bonding with the family and the relationship there, or that's one of the problems. Because when Carol Ann, the mother, uh, gives birth, uh, there's no opportunity to hold the child. There's no opportunity for them to be intimate. There's just the child in the isolator. And basically, she goes home. And she does not see that child for a month. The, uh, the dietician who, uh, who is responsible for getting germ-free formula and germ-free anything in David's isolator, uh, finally calls her and says, you've got a beautiful baby boy here, and he needs to see his mommy. Uh, you know, sort of get back in the game. You know, get back in the game. And she starts coming then, and slowly but surely, I think, uh, you know, the, the self-protective instincts that kept her away for not wanting to go through hell again with grief start to be pushed aside by maternal instincts. And she, you know, uh, will come to see David uh, basically about once a week. You know, she'll come on Sundays and spend, I've, I've seen the nurse's charts. 
about how much time she spends. So the nurses uh, with David uh, are confronted with a child who uh, basically doesn't have, with the exception of Patricia Be uh, Bielmere, this uh, woman who sees him at night, doesn't really have a bonding relationship because the nurses are on three shifts. Uh, they come and they go. Uh, he is you know, exposed to so many people. They take photographs of his mother on the isolator and says, mommy, mommy, and they repeat mommy, 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 mommy. So he'll have some way of knowing who his mother is. So uh, there is an attempt when David is quite young by someone and I think I know who it is, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to speculate in public. Uh, but there's a person who has a dark vision of David's future, and I think correctly divines that his life is going to be difficult, very, very difficult. And so there was an attempt to sabotage the isolator. Uh, it was discovered in time to plug the holes and to make sure that uh, uh, at that point he wasn't colonized by my, you know, my germs. <clears throat> but uh, hospitals are dangerous places. Uh, people can help you and they can hurt you. David, when he's three, gets a huge break. It's a huge break. Because that's when M Mary Murphy, the woman I pointed out, comes into his life. And she's the one who is divorced, she has an older son, she's a really, she's dead now, but she was a really neat lady, had an undergraduate degree, degree in engineering, and had a very mechanical bent and aptitude, very smart, and uh, loved to do things with her hands. So she saw David's huge deprivation in terms of stimuli, and would take clocks in and take them apart and show them how they'd work. I mean, she took so much crap <laughs> into that room and just, you know, deconstructed it uh, and put it back together and read to him. And uh, so they do bond. Uh, David uh, is uh, very close to her. Uh, it's cool. Later, when David is dealing with so much rage, uh, his parents are very strict and try to keep him very, uh, very, you know, close to the vest and very obedient. Uh, it's Mary who teaches him curse words. <laughs> you know, Mary says, you know, you feel like shut today? You want to say that? You know, so she gives him permission to be miserable and to, and to vent that misery with uh, these calculated acts of defiance that all kids need. One of the central problems David, you know, faces is the central problem of youth, and that's, you know, independence, the search for self. You know, how do, how, how do I become me? You know, and how do you become someone when you're totally, absolutely dependent for everything on other people? How do you, you know, how do you, how do you become, how do you become you? So uh, anyway, uh, David deals with tragedy uh, the first five years of his life when each of the three members of the Troika who put him in the isolator one by one leave. The first to leave is Jack Montgomery. Okay, he takes a job at Alabama at, at, uh, at, at a med school there. The second to leave is Carol Ann, or excuse me, Mary Ann South, who goes to Penn, the uh, Children's Hospital shop at Philadelphia. The third to leave, and by far the most emotionally devastating for David is Raphael Wilson, the Catholic brother. Because he is the one that David of the three is close to. Uh, David was terrified of Montgomery because after they got control of the body, Montgomery was the only one who was allowed to do penipunctures with him uh, to take blood. So David always associated him with pain. And uh, Mary Ann uh, was, is basically a, you know, a bench scientist. And if, and if you talk with her and are talking about David's case, she's going to tell you a lot about T cells and B cells. And, and you know, she's going to discuss uh, uh, issues in, uh, you know, uh, a lot of her published work has to, have, has to do with his lack of production of T cells. So she's very interested in the scientific warrant of his case. 
But the person who tried to uh, interact with David on a, on a more human scale was Raphael Wilson. And Raphael Wilson, uh, with the best of intentions, really made David very, very afraid. David, at one point, as an act of defiance when he's four, uh, tries to take a fork and start, you know, puncturing the, uh, you know, the, the membrane. And what Raphael Wilson does then is to give him a vision of hell. He tells him, in language that a four-year-old can understand, that if you do this again, you, you will have sores on every part of your body. They will be on your tongue, in your eyes, in your ears, down your throat, in your mouth, and those sores will be so, so painful that you'll be in agony and you can't stand it. Now, he did that to alert David with the best of intentions to not sabotage you know, his, his, his life bubble, his support structure. But in the process, he so terrorized the child that David, from then until the time he dies, has a recurring dream. And the recurring dream is the germ, the king of the germs, and the germ queen. In this dream, David is being pursued by germs, the king and the queen, that have teeth that are six inches long, razor sharp, come to a dagger point, and they want his flesh. And he runs, and he runs, and he runs, and he gets to a hill. Uh, Freud would have a lot of stuff to chew on in this dream. He gets to a hill, he gets up the hill, he can slap down some of the minions, some of the smaller ones, but the tougher ones keep coming. And then he wakes up screaming. Well, I can't imagine a better image of hell in my mind than, you know, the king of the germs dream that he has. So, uh, when Raphael Wilson leaves. He goes to join this small Catholic school in Oregon. He leaves the, uh, the faculty at Baylor. David uh, becomes hysterical, takes excrement, and puts it all over the inside of his isolator and clogs up the, the airports. Uh, his, his terror and grief are transcendent. Uh, just unbelievable. When, when the original group leave, and they've all left by the time David's five, he goes through a, a, uh, a very uh, difficult period. Uh, the person who is then assigned to take care of his case is a person who did not want his case, uh, a Dr. Nichols. And uh, Dr. Nichols came down really hard on the nurses, uh, saying that if David, if something happened to David, that he was going to hold them responsible because he had other patients. He had to come and see them, you know, only when, you know, or, or he could see David as he could, but that their, his, his safety and his primary care was their responsibility. Well, in one sense, David was a, uh, a bonanza for the Texas Medical Center, and in another sense, he was, he was, he was a, a troublesome property. All those newspaper articles created a bond of affection with the public and this child. When David was two, Dr. Blattner, who was the head of pediatrics at Baylor, had a, uh, a come-to-Jesus talk with Montgomery about pulling the plug. He says, we have no, we have no end in sight. You've done your best. Where's this going? Aren't we talking about a failed experiment? And bring David out, you know, we'll try a, we'll try a transplant as best we can, but you know, he needs a shot to live outside of the isolator. And he's, you know, we gotta, we gotta move on. Uh, he does mention in passing the expense of this child, okay? So Montgomery calls his bluff. 
and says, okay, you ordered me to do it, and you put the order in writing, and I'm going to take this order to the press, and we're going to have a press conference in which we announce to the public that David's coming out of the ice for a year. It's too damn expensive, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll see how that plays. So Blattner, of course, pulls in his horns. But the point that Blattner made will be echoed again year after year as David's situation doesn't change. So under Nichols, David uh, is drifting. There's just no other, there's no other, he's drifting. The person who <clears throat> changes the formula comes in when David is nine years old, and that's William Shearer. Shearer uh, is a pediatric immunologist who came to Baylor from uh, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. He orders a full-blown psychiatric evaluation of David. And the result is that uh, three different psychologists examine David and work up a profile of his mental health. And in that profile, the consensus is reached that David is psychotic, that he's had uh, so much uh, trauma that he is, you know, losing, losing his grip, you know, on, on his sanity. David doesn't come out of the isolator for three more years. That diagnosis is made when he's nine. <clears throat> I asked one of the psychiatrists whom I interviewed who made that diagnosis, I said, well, how do you explain to me the fact that the child stays in for three more years? And this individual answered me by saying, you ever kill a kid? I said, no, no. He said, well, Jim, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? He said, we take David out, he dies. You ever kill a, you ever kill a kid? No, I haven't. He says, well, then think about what we were up against. So I said, okay, so I think about it. What Shearer does, slowly but surely, with enormous skill, with enormous compassion, with, it, with heartfelt sincerity, he starts <coughs> negotiating with the family. There... Their position on David was always the same. The hospital promises that David would be safe in the bubble. The hospital's responsibility is to keep David safe in the bubble. The hospital's responsibility, the medical profession's responsibility, is to find a cure for our kid. And we're not taking him out because that wasn't the deal. The deal was you keep him safe. Okay, that's the argument. So Shearer painstakingly, and I think with consummate skill, gets the family to start thinking about alternatives and what the scenario is and what the future holds for David. Because David, in that isolator, is now becoming a very troublesome property. He uh, is, you know, for a while he was the pet monkey. I mean, I hate to put it that way. But dignitaries would come, you know, would come to Baylor and they would take him and show him the boy in the bubble and show off their, you know, their, 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 their prize, you know, their prize patient. And so David finally, you know, he's a smart little kid. I mean, he finally gets it. And he starts performing in ways they don't want to see him perform. He starts, you know, doing, uh, you know, I won't go into his full repertoire, but a bright child who is being, in effect, tortured by his environment, can be very creative in ways to express his anger. And David explored many of those, many of those possibilities. Uh, so Shearer is working to get the family to consider uh, alternatives to further incarceration. And as the family kind of wrestles with this, they panic. They absolutely panic. And they revert to the mode of thinking that David's safe in the bubble and the hospital's breaking the deal and we've got to figure out a way to fight back. So it's like Shakespeare. It's like Shakespeare calling the actors back in subsequent scenes. They turn for emotional and substantive support to the original troika of doctors. They have a secret meeting out in El Paso. 
they share with the three doctors who come from their respective institutions, their fear that the hospital is gonna pull the plug and their kid's gonna die. So now you have mono to mono combat between the old doctors who no longer have responsibility for the case, who you know gone back with their careers and they're fine, but who are still hostage of the way of thinking about that child that they revert to that way of thinking is still good. They don't you know they don't want David to come out. That's defeat. That puts a lie to all the promises they made about the happy ending that would come for David. So that's not going to work for them. They fight back. The cheerer, again, uh, does just this good job of being himself. You know, he, he just kind of holds his ground and stays calm and makes the arguments. And so long story short, when David's 12, there's a breakthrough. Uh, there, at this point, there are two centers in the United States that are doing unmatched bone marrow transplants, and they're treating the marrow to uh, prevent graft versus host, this horrible rejection uh, uh, deaths. And one of the centers is at Harvard, at Brigham Young. So, uh, or is it Brigham Young or, no, I think, it, I think it is Brigham Young. But I have to go to my notes. I know it's at Harvard. Um, so once again, uh, Carol Ann, the, uh, not Carol Ann, but the, uh, the sister, uh, is impressed into service. She's, they take bone marrow from her hip. They fly it out to Boston on a private rich guy's jet. You know, I, I love Texas. You know, you, you've got Big Daddy Warbucks, you know. Use my jet. And they have it treated, and they fly it back, and you saw the scenes where, where he's transplanted. And then it's the waiting game. You know, what do we got? Is it going to work? Well, there's no part of David's story that isn't at some level heartbreaking. Because what people didn't know was that the sister has a very, very common virus called Epstein-Barr. And this child who has no immune system then gets the bone marrow transplant that's been treated for Something, but not for Epstein Barr. Within a matter of weeks, he starts to become very ill. Within a matter of three and a half weeks, his body explodes with tumors, internal tumors, and he's hemorrhaging massively, you know, inside. So David uh, dies a very agonizing death. And when it's clear that he's not going to make it, uh, but he's much too ill to, be to benefit, I think, from much human contact, they finally take him out of the isolator. And his mother can finally touch him and hold him for the first time. And so David dies. And his death scene, again, is Shakespearean. The, the doctors who put him in the isolator are all come there, and they're, they're there for the, for the death vigil. Shearer, who's done his priestly duty to try to uh, bring this sad case to, a, to an end. They're across each other at the hall, their arms like this, looking at each other. And then the sister, who is, you know, in horrible psychic pain, this is the second time she's been a donor, both mothers have died, is beating her head in the hall, saying, I've killed my brother. I've killed my brother. So, very quickly, the, uh, the physicians found some redeeming, some redeeming parts of the story. There uh, are articles written shortly after David's death showing that uh, David's uh, tragic death is incontrovertible evidence that a virus can be a carcinogen, that this Epstein-Barr causes cancer. So, there's a lot of buzz about that. You know, science has, science has benefited. And there's a lot of effort within the Houston community to celebrate David's courage and the heroic efforts on the part of the physicians who tried so hard to save him. And that 
David's courage was worth celebrating. I can't imagine a child who, uh, who fought more gallantly than David did to live and to, and to, and to become a person. Uh, I mean, he was always a person, but to become a person who could enjoy his life. Uh, and so what, what has followed now is a kind of cult of David in which his case is not left over. It's certainly not to told um, with the rough spots, but it's a, it's a celebration okay, of heroic doctors who did their best and a courageous patient who tried his hardest. And it can certainly be seen that way, but if you see it that way, you're, you're distorting. You're distorting so much truth. The David that I'm writing about is a cautionary tale. It's a story of good intentions without thinking through what happens if certain contingencies aren't met. And it's a story of hubris because there's enormous hubris in the words of many of the people that I've, 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 I've described. And it's also a story of redeeming love because uh, the mother, once she gets into the game, you know, uh, does her best to, to be a good mother. David, this charismatic little guy in many ways, attracts two wonderful surrogate mothers. But his life is still very, very sad. One of the, one of the scenes that, uh, uh, with which I opened the book, okay, because I want, I want to get David in front of you and not have the long wind up, as I have David when he's about six in his isolator screaming at the top of his lungs, hey, you guys, hey, you guys, hey, you guys. He's trying to get somebody to come in his room. He's begging, he's begging for attention. No child should have to. I'll be happy is not the right word, but I'll take questions or comments. Have you? Toward, toward the end of his life, when he was 11, 12 years old, I know he was diagnosed as having as being psychotic. But was he able to have conversations about, oh, yes. about his life and what where he intended to go with it? Did did he want to live at that time? Uh, as best I can tell, uh, David's communication with his parents was very circumscribed. I think he was under a lot of uh, frontal pressure there to be um, um, a very model child. I'm sorry. A very model child. Uh, the person with whom he can share his inner feelings and uh, rage, fear, uh, frustration, uh, anxiety is Mary Murphy. Uh, and Mary's descriptions of David in those years, uh, David had an ability, which he describes beautifully, to kind of pull it together. You know, he, he could, he could, he, he would be um, hysterical uh, in some instances, and just uh, sobbing uncontrollably, uh, bouncing, you know, off, off the walls, uh, doing, you know, uh, you know and then he could, uh, especially for his parents, apparently uh, tone it down. And be, and be. But she asked him, you know, I've been, I've been reading the literature, uh, because it's something I haven't written in the chapters yet. But there's a pretty helpful literature on what children understand about death. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, I'm processing uh, that, that literature. I'm trying to look at the facts that I have, the descriptions that I have of David in his last years, um, certainly he understood that, okay? And certainly he understood that his life in the isolator was becoming untenable. 
But he also, at least according to Mary, and I have no reason to doubt it. Um, well, he put it, my her description, he put it well. He put it as well as the child's parent. He says, I have two fears. One fear is I'll never get out of the ice cream. And the other fear is that I will. What am I going to do? My wife asked me, she says, why don't you write a happy book? <laughs> 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 At the noon lecture, you discussed the Justine experiments and the resulting President's Commission on Biomedical and Behavioral Research, which led to the institution of IRBs. Right. Well, it starts with those hearings, you know, with the right. congressional and hearings. This is Kennedy and Murray with his yeah. early years. Um, right. Well, yeah, this is this is this is the point that I hammered in the, ch in the chapter that I've written. Um, it seems to me that the field of bioethics. Uh, and I'm speaking now as an intellectual story, uh, is called into existence largely by a series of very prominent cases that uh, present to the public many of the, you know, of the really hard stuff to be people deal with, you know, hate. Uh, and the, uh, the thing that has always amazed me about David's case is that he stays under the radar. And his life is literally simultaneous with the rise of bioethics in the field that has some cultural authority. You know, but he stays under the radar. So, so and, and what makes it, just a second, I'm, I'm on a roll here. I, 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 thought, I thought of something that will interest you. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought of something that will interest you. There is one bioethics consultation in David's life. One. 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 Okay. And it occurred when he's three. Okay? You guys know John Fletcher? Sure. Sure, you know the name, right? Okay. Well, John Fletcher was uh, on a temporary lecture gig or appointment or something at Rice, at Rice University, in circa 1975. Okay. And the chaplain, the chaplain at Texas Children's, a guy named Lawrence Wilson, whom you may know from Columbia, because I think he's now the chaplain there. Uh, Lawrence Wilson was deeply, deeply concerned about David. He would go by that kid's room and look and shake his head and say, okay, you know, what's going on here? So he beats on the three doctors, the Troika, to talk about not the T cells, not the technology, you know, I've got this long detailed description of how the isolator works. And if you talk to Barfield Wilson, that's all he wanted to talk about. You know, it's this beautiful technology that keeps the kid alive. Lawrence wants them to talk about David. What's going on with this kid? So they get, uh, uh, they make an overture to Fletcher and ask if he'll come over and kind of lead a discussion. Of this case. Well, you know, you could, if you brought in shop first, if you know his writings, you couldn't have brought in a kind of uh, bigger piece of artillery. You know, he comes uh, pretty close to euthanasia. The, you know, he, he, he goes out in some ideas that are uh, uh, opportunities to have good discussions, <laughs> as in you know, debates. Uh, so Wilson, they get a room, they get a room, and then so many people come, they think it's gonna be a global deal. And so many people, so many people come, it's not a room like this where you know most of the seats are empty. Uh, they have to go to a big room because so many damn people have come and they want to talk about this case. So each of the three doctors uh, presents like a 10-minute you know uh, overview. Of, of the case. Raphael Wilson talks about technology. Mary Ann South talks about cheap cells. And Jack Montgomery talks about his, uh, his hopes in the future for a transplant and patient care and how David is flourishing and doing well in the hospital. So Wilson then gives the podium to 
Uh, Fletcher. And then all hell breaks loose. I mean, Fletcher comes, you know, he's got guns blazing on both sides. He's asking the hard questions. He's really upsetting people with his, with his uh, uh, not buying the formula. You know, he's, he's off the reservation. Uh, so what happens is that Jack Montgomery, who's in the position, explodes in his chair and says, this is pure odd. You can you can talk about these kinds of issues all you want to. I have patients to care for, and, and he storms out. That's what I'm got. So that's the only time for Conover that there's any effort to have a, a, a review. But then what's really funny? It's it's, it's like you know taming the shrew almost. Uh, Wilson and Fletcher hit it off. They you know they do they hit it off. And uh, Fletcher, who's at UVA, invites Wilson to come and give, you know, give a talk on data. He was just, you know, like 76, I think it is. And I love technology. It was film. I got the film. <laughs> I got, you know, uh, I, I love research because the damn stuff's out there and I'm going to find it. <laughs> that's, that's just short and long way. Uh, I love research. And so in this, in this uh, presentation, Wilson talks about technology. He gives you a, a elegant description of how the isolator works and all the heroic measures to sterilize everything that goes into it so that they're keeping him as germ-free as, as humanly possible. And then what happens at UVA is the same thing that happens in Cambridge. People start coming to the microphone and questioning. And there's one guy, you know, comes to the microphone and says, what is David's quality of life? And what is his prognosis? And are you worried about his mental development as he continues to be untouched by human hands? Uh, to have less space than a, uh, a murderer would have in prison? Uh, no, come on. What's, what are we doing here, folks? But that's the only ethical, uh, it's a one-two kind of discussion that I know of. And this, as bioethics is coming of age, developing cultural authority, uh, you know, those, those, those deans are, are hiring these folks, you know, you're, you're starting to get so old. That's why I'm... He was never, even though it was an experiment, it was never viewed as an experiment by the early people who were in charge of ethical evaluation at uh, no, actually, there are, no, it does go to the IRB. It yeah, it does go to the IRB. And the IRB, uh, you know, there's this conundrum. Uh, is it research or treatment? Yeah. And there's a lot to discuss in David's case uh, about uh, those distinctions and the ways in which those terms can become conflated. Uh, so, uh, well, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, uh, the Virginia session, was it shut down because people left or? No, no, there no, any, no, no. The Virginia so session. It's probably more open discussion yeah, there. Yeah, it, it's, it's much less defensive. Okay, it's right. much less defensive. It's a much more wide ranging uh, discussion. And uh, Wilson uh, just doesn't get it. I mean, you know, yeah. he's, he's like a, uh, a well prepped. Uh, with us, you know. Uh, I don't care what question you ask me, I'm going to go back to my testimony. <laughs> Thank you. So, that's, yes. what, that's why I wondered about the concept of this being starting out as being well intentioned. Excuse me? I wonder about the notion that the original doctors uh -huh. who advised the family yes. were actually well intentioned in their. Well, you know, I think, I think you've got three people. In fact, I know you've got three people, and I think you've got uh, different intentions among them. Uh, I think, and but did any of them have really good intentions, or was it? A, I, there's no question in my mind that all three had good intentions, as they understood their child. <coughs> okay. No one, no one in this group wants to hurt that child. You know, the, the, they are not evil people, but they are people who have some tunnel vision. 
and have their, you know, the uh, the concerns that they have, the interests that they have, the equities they want to balance. Okay. And with Mary Ann South, she wants a child long to live long enough to teach her some pedagogy and, and, and skills. She wants to see what's going to happen with those, you know. One theory that she's working with, she's hoping, she's saying, because you have to understand that this is a this is the infancy of pediatric myelitics. I mean, of, of pediatric immunology. It's, it's the disease is imperfectly understood. They don't understand how many forms of skin there are. Uh, you know, the molecular biology has not been worked out. Yeah, so, but I think it was she said. I mean, initially, always there is a good intention, but then they start to really late. I mean, there is no checking for these people. Right. That's the problem, and what amazed me is that always in any, even in any visit, right. that any patient go to regular doctor, right. even for a screening for mammography or whatever, always is telling you the good right. and not the harm. And always there is a harm. And never, never, ever. Even this is a very telling thing that everybody who has to know that if there is no checking, yeah. we, we always, those that we do research and see patients, whatever, we start to be in love with what we are doing and we start to forget the, the person. Yeah. Even if the initial thing is our... Well, you know, something <laughs> I neglected to mention that yeah. we're, we're sharing, I'll go back and pick up a stitch here. Yeah. Uh, is that the parents were not invited to that uh, to mm -hmm. okay. No parents, no parents mm -hmm. there. But I think you know. I I think uh, I mean I. Uh, if you guys want to want to see a program on this, by the way, uh, I've done a couple of projects for the American Experience. Uh, oh, yeah. You know the premier, the premier uh, public uh, tele PBS. Um, yeah. uh, I've worked with Barry uh, uh, Lippman, uh, who is a star producer. He's a Brilliant filmmaker, and we work on. What is the name? Derek Goodman, B A R A K Goodman, good man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the, 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 and the system, uh, the there is a there is a American Experience uh, program on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did uh, he did Mackenzie. Uh, we worked together on the Mackenzie project. <clears throat> when that was um, when that was finally filmed in Cannes. Um, he rented the theater down in the Battery District in New York and had a few people, you know, who worked on the film with him uh, to dinner and they saw it and got the preview it and whatnot. And at the end of that, he said, "What are you doing now, Jim?" I said, "Nothing. I'm sort of five and brain dead." <laughs> he said, "Don't give me that shit. What are you doing?" <laughs> I said, "Well, I'm working on this guy, David Pitter, you know, the level boy." So I pitched it, and a couple of weeks later, he called and said, um, "Yeah, yeah." He said, "Let's do it." So uh, we got to make a film. Uh, on that, and uh, I think it would be a wonderful teaching, you know, you know teaching uh, chestnut for you. Uh, yeah. It's uh, yeah. all the all the doctors are in there. Uh, I'm a talking head, but I told him to keep me, you know, low profile because I want I'm, camera needs to be on people to you know to get this. But it's uh, I think it does a pretty good job of exploring David's life. It's not as graphic as I was today. It, it pulls some punches, but uh, I think it does a good job. But David's family, you know, seriously, the thing to remember is they love the kid. They want the best for him. Mean, there's no part of them that wanted to prove the child. There is so much love and sacrifice that they made in their lives to, to, to bring him home when they did. In the hospital, David has 24 7 because he's got three shifts. When the med kid goes home for weeks, they're it, you know. They care for them and everybody, it's all hands on deck to make sure he's okay. The dad, though, none of the teachers, I mean, the dad was the one who wanted to have the son so much that it was like, let's roll the dice. This God the won't let this happen. Yeah, yeah this but I, it, he's, that's the only picture of him. Well, he, uh, he wants it that way. No, he wants it that way. Okay, with, he doesn't like to be you know, a with, celebrity. Uh, with Carol Ann, it's very much Madonna and Child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Joseph. It's way the hell over there. But you is know. he still was he still involved with David's life? Oh, he can choose not know, to have his picture uh, taken. You know, he was he was deeply involved with David's life okay. because it was he who had to master the technology to have the oscillators at home. Mm -hmm. And he's a very uh, he's an accountant. He's a professional, mm -hmm. you know, he's a professional man. He's very mechanical. He's very competent mm -hmm. and very much a 
he crossed the Uriah Dodge, that's the detail guy. And his uh, his work to keep David safe in that isolator was, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Houston has these horrible storms. Oh, yeah. You know, imagine. and generates, so he creates redundant generator right. systems. He yeah. works out a deal with the fire department that if they get in real trouble, they'll come out and help. Right. Um, right. He's a thoughtful uh, guy, but, uh, you know, it all begins with, I want to sign. You know, so how often he would go home to David? How often? Because he was in the hospital, but sometimes he went home. So how often did he? he well, he spends more of his life the last couple of years at home uh, than ever before. But typically, he'll go home for six weeks at a time. Then he'll be in the hospital for like three months. And then he'll go home for six weeks. And yeah. then he'll be in the hospital. But, 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 but I, yeah, the time frame is going to figure out. Yeah. This lady's had her hand I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's, we'll I'm let sorry. you the last question. Um, I, I, I was just wondering if there is an effective treatment now for SCID, and did the experience with David make any uh, It is bone marrow transplant, that? but it doesn't have to be a matched donor because they've pretty much done a good job, as I understand it, of working out the, uh, the uh, treating the marrow to, uh, so you don't have to have a first, you know, all the antigens don't have to find out the way they have to. Well, yeah. Um, That's the difficult part because yeah. at the age, I mean, ninety percent of us we are yeah. we have is the invite, so that. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank much you. For Thank